Welcome to the Reg Netball Club. Great that everyone could come along today. Um, we're here to discuss Martin Krieger's uh, new book, which is called Fiddle Sales Make Ideals in the World. Did you bring a copy with you? Oh, <laughs> Copies of that book are available at the Co bookshop if anyone's inspired to read it afterwards um, after hearing this discussion. Uh, we have three very eminent professors here to. Uh, to talk about the book today. We of course have Martin Krieger himself, we have Professor Mark, uh, Malcolm Feely and we have Professor John Braithwaite. And I thought what I'd do is just briefly introduce them and then um, and then we can move on to this the, the uh, discussion. So Martin uh, Martin is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory at UNSW. He's also the co-director of the Network of Interdisciplinary Studies of Law and he's also an adjunct professor here at Bregnet. Uh, Martin's undergraduate degrees were in politics, philosophy and law, and uh, his doctorate was in the history of ideas, and, and his work since then spans all those areas and more. He's visited and lectured in a, a number of universities overseas and here. Uh, his first book, well, I think, was in 1979, is that right? Mm -hmm. With Eugene Kamenka about the concept of bureaucracy, and, He's had many, many publications since then, and culminating in the book we're here to discuss today, which I understand is the first book think treatment of cells next <coughs> few years. Professor Malcolm Feely uh, is the Claire Sanders Clements Dean's Chair Professor of Law at Berkeley University. Um, before Berkeley, he was a fellow at Yale Law School, and he taught at New York University and the University of Wisconsin. And he's also been a visiting professor at Hebrew University, Kobe University, and Princeton University. Like Martin, Malcolm has written extensively about all sorts of things, including the criminal justice process, federalism, crime history, prison privatisation. And uh, he's currently in Australia as the 2012 Fulbright, Fulbright Flinders University Distinguished Chair for five months. Uh, to undertake research into privatisation in the criminal justice system in Australia as part of the comparative study he's undertaken. Professor John Braithwaite will be well known to most of you here. He's a distinguished professor here at Regnet. Uh, he's the founder of Regnet and he's also currently on the second ARC Federation Fellowship. At X. 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 Yes. It's over yes. now. <laughs> <laughs> My information is out of date. I don't, uh, you know, and I can't, I don't have the wonderful titles of these guys. I can't even call myself the Jeffrey Brennan uh, Professor. Memorial Professor. You're the John Braidwick. The John Braidwick. John's uh, main areas of interest amongst the millions that he covers have been criminology, <laughs> business regulation, and peace studies. Um, and he doesn't do things by half. He's, he's currently undertaking a 20-year comparative project into peace building compared with colleagues from Rengue. And I think his last field work trip to the Congo, which is not something most of us can say. So the way we're going to do this is that Martin is elected to speak last. So Malcolm's going to um, uh, set, set us off, uh, speak for about 15 minutes, then John for about 15 minutes. And then Martin, and then we should have ample time for some discussion on questions. About this time, 42 years ago, I moved from the Midwest in the United States to uh, New York. And two or three days later, I, uh, I found myself in a car being driven to the wedding of a, of a friend in Brooklyn. We're driving along, and I, and I look up and I notice a street sign. And it says Flatbush. Now, at Peter Grabowski at least will know about Flatbush, if none of you, no, no one else does. Flatbush is the area where Ebbets Field, the great Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team played. And I was so excited. I thought that Flatbush was a state of mind. And all of a sudden, I found myself on and in Flatbush. Uh, well, this is the same feeling I had when I walked into this building, or the building next door, the RegNet building, because 
I've always thought of Regnet as a state of mind. It has just <laughs> permeated the world. It has this mythical quality. And to actually be here is, is, uh, is, is I mean, it's really exciting. And it, and, it, and it conjures up that memory of being, being driving by Old Ebbets Field on Flatbush <laughs> Avenue in Brooklyn. So, 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 so thank you, thank you uh, 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 so much. It's just, it's fan fantastic. Uh, and I guess we're, I guess we have a little, we're Regnet East in Berkeley with their, I mean, there's a lot of flowing back and forth. I see Neil Gunningham pops in, uh, in our building, uh, you know, every, every now and then with, uh, to surprise me. So anyway, it's fantastic. Thank you. So that's, that's my, my way of thank you. And, and I've had several of you have been wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, hosts and introduced me to this, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Canberra in the last few days. Uh, Secondly, by way of, uh, if he doesn't say it, I will say it, uh, uh, mea culpa. Uh, uh, Martin wrote this book because I badgered him uh, mercilessly for, for some period of time because I thought that Philip Selznick deserved a book-length treatment and I uh, thought that uh, Martin, who is, you know, you think he's part of Regnet, you know, people in Sydney, he thinks he's there. We in Berkeley think he's part of us, so he's he's in Berkeley alone. So, but I, I thought he was the perfect person, and uh, and 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 indeed indeed uh, my my instincts have have have, have, have proved, proven absolutely right. This is a, a tough-minded, uh, uh, not syrupy uh, uh, treatment, not of Philip's biography. We learn a bit about Philip, enough to know how his ideas were framed, and then were launched into into uh, one more. Uh, History, or not even history of ideas, but but examination of, of, of three sets of inter interrelated ideas. I think of this book as a textbook in the best tradition of British textbooks. And uh, when I've been in Dillon's in, in in London and looked up, I mean years ago and even now, I see really smart textbooks that. Uh, where they take an idea, a person, a concept, and they just interrogate it in a systematic way that is illuminating uh, to, to the reader. And uh, that's a tradition that I don't find in the United States, and I don't know whether it exists here in, uh, in Australia, but, it's, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but it exists in, in England. I'm thinking of, of uh, David Garland's Punishment Society. He review, views that as a text, and I think it is a smart and and some and, and, and some of uh, Roger Cotterell's works among among many many others. So anyway, it's in that tradition. It's a really smart and and I mean this as as high praise because those books are really really important. So what I'd like to do is to spend a, a, a couple of minutes laying out since I'm going first laying out uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the structure of the book. It's very simple and straightforward, and and then and then turn to two of the three topics that he addresses at, at some length. Uh, the first section of the book, or really the introduction before he gets to the sections, uh, is, a, is a treatment of, 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 uh, of uh, Philip Selznick in New York City as one of uh, the Trotskyites in a cell on, uh, uh, on, on, on uh, uh, the Upper West Side at City College in the 1930s. Uh, I think modern American sociology was born there. His, his, his supporters and his adversaries inclu included Alvin uh, 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 Goldner, uh, 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 Nathan, Nathan Glazer, Seymour Martin Lipset, uh, uh, Irving Crystal, Irving Howe, and on and on and on. And they were, they were dividing and subdividing like amoeba uh, in, 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 uh, with respect to the purity of, of, of ideas. And, and uh, Selznick uh, was always too smart to be wholly captivated uh, by the, by uh, by any of the various Marxists, including the Trotskyists, um, of which he was a part, I always, uh, there's there's a reserve in, in Philip that never allows him to commit himself, and partly because he's skeptical and he's smart and he's, he's he was his own person, uh, but he was always attracted. He was like he was like a, a moth to a, fly, uh, to a to a flame that wanted to get there, but ha was smarter than most moths and, and knew when <laughs> knew when when to come back. So 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 at any rate, this this is this this is the milieu in which all these, I mean, this whole generation of, uh, of immediate post-war sociologists uh, came of age. And, and, it, uh, and, and it's really important because I think it's important because all of them ask the big questions in the way that you guys still do at Regnet, but a way a lot of 
the hyper-professionalized social scientists don't. They break things down until they can measure more precisely. They're asking the big question. They're, you know, they read Hobbes and they're wondering, why does society cohere? What, what holds it together? What's the problem of order? The problem of power? The problem of good versus evil? Partly, this is this is this is this is their response to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to the to the twin evils of communism, and and uh, and uh, Nazism, and and uh, trying to reconcile the growth of modernity in large scale organizations and mass organizations, and how do you control those to to uh, uh, to to allow individuals. And institutions to flourish, and this this is this, and so this preoccupies uh, 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 Philip throughout his life, and I think it has its roots in alcove C or B or whatever it was there in 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 uh, in, uh, in the basement of, of of City College where they these guys these guys uh, d debated it. So so he 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 lays it he lays this he lays this out. Now this leads him through. Unlike me, and I think probably I suspect most of us, uh, uh, through a, a, a really coherent set of projects, not a single one, but set of projects that, that each sort of emerges uh, 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 from, from the previous one. His first, his first concern in the first big section of the book deals with Philip and organization theory. Uh, the, sec the second, the second, uh, the second uh, uh, big section uh, deals with uh, with Philip and uh, his particular take on the sociology of law, and the last one uh, deals with Philip uh, and even more general with his with his uh, with his uh, uh, theory, social <coughs> philosophy, normative philosophy on on communitary communitary uh, communitarian uh, 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 society and, and and the communitarian theory. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, he's Philip. I'm sorry. Martin is smart in interrogating each one of these things, in 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 pointing out the strengths, pointing out the weaknesses, and 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 showing how there's uh, there are certain consistent threads that tie them together. Not just for the purpose of tying together, but to show how they really enrich. Uh, you know, there's a, a cumulative enrichment of the of the of the of the enterprise. Now here's here's the dilemma for or here's the challenge for Philip, and here's where here's maybe my first uh, my first criticism of Philip. I should say that Philip was my colleague for many many years. Indeed, indeed, I. The day I was appointed at Berkeley, uh, I was I was told that I was I was a replacement for Philip Selznick, and I said I never wanted to hear that again. No one, no one replaced. But indeed, it was his retirement that occasioned uh, the opportunity for me to, to, to get there. And I, uh, and he had retired, but remained active in retirement for close to 30 years after after 30, 25 years. So, uh, John, you have you. <laughs> uh, so, here's what. Here's, here's, here's what I think Philip, Philip wanted to do. He was attracted to Marxism, communism, to the, to, to the revolution in the 30s because it was an effort to blaze a brave new world. But he was, had his feet on the ground. He had read, he had read Roberto Michel, about the iron law of oligarchy, he had read. He had read. He had read. He had read. Uh, he had read Weber. Uh, he had read. He had read Dewey, uh, the good pragmatist. And I think uh, I always uh, thought of, uh, of Philip as something of a of a priest, and indeed one of or a religious figure. And one of his one of his uh, uh, most uh, 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 one of the, the people that was most influential in his life was Reinhold Niebuhr, and 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 and. Uh, and uh, I don't think you mentioned the title of Niebuhr's book in, 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 in here, but, but but it captures but it captures uh, it captures Philip's Philip's uh, concern, and the, and and that is that is uh, uh, the quest for proximate problem uh, proximate solutions to insoluble problems. It seems to me that captures exactly what Philip was 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 trying to do. He reckoned, I don't think he had a particularly tragic view in life, but he or a cynical view of it, not at all. But but nevertheless, he knew that that one of the features of modernity, maybe the one of the features of social life more generally, is uh, is 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 uh, 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 the the power of evil, 
and 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 the power of and, and the evil and the evil consequences of mass organization. So he's so so he's preoccupied. He's preoccupied. That. So anyway, he wants to harness. He wants he wants to harness harness energy for collective purpose, for good, and he looks to two institutions in succession to do that. And I think it's really a continuation of it. The first one, the first, the first, or the first institution that he looks at, uh, and uh, is an organization. And, and he's the father of modern organization theory. I think he's first to really sort of think about uh, and theorize in sustained way of, about organization. And and then and then the the next one is 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 law. These are both two two of the uh, two of the uh, uh, two of the institutions that are or uh, that are that that are used to try to to try to uh, to try to harness energy uh, for collective purpose. Harness energy in a way that allows that allows the the power of the collective to move forward and accomplish things, but constrains it so that it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, get off terribly off course or destroy or dis or or, 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 or wreak, wreak evil. Now, one of the things that strikes me, and I think Sheldon Wolin uh, points this out in his criticism, is that is that these two institutions, both organization and 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 uh, law, are. I, w I don't want to say apolitical, but if someone were going to do a political analysis of modern social life and mass movements and 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 and, and social control and 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 change and harnessing harnessing uh, uh, energies to do good, uh, uh, one would think that there would be a a stronger uh, a stronger appreciation for politics and maybe political parties. And I think maybe his and this may be you know doing something. That, Need not be done. Uh, maybe Philip uh, 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 recoiled at uh, at at, uh, at, uh, at 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 party politics because he had had too much uh, with communist party politics and the variety of factions within it. Whatever the case, uh, whatever the case, both in his organization analysis and his law analysis, there is a curious, a curious absence of appreciation for politics. It's it's it, it's not lost, but uh, entirely. But but it's it, it's not it, it's not not there. And so uh, to the extent that you could and and you sort of talk around that, Morton. But to the extent that you could sort of address that uh, in the remarks, I, I would love 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 to hear. And, and if tell me I'm wrong, I would I would love to love to love to You're be wrong. corrected. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me let me look first at at organization theory. Here he wrote here he wrote three big books, really big books. TVA, TVA and the Grassroots is, you know, the the ur text of uh, for organ, organization theory, and uh, it's it's a study of the TVA going in to do all sorts of good, and it's a, and but at the same time it's the television the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, and uh, uh, which was going to electrify all of the of the southeast. It was a big New Deal project, and and uh, powerful smart. Leaders go in to organize this, and and they quickly adapt to local political social conditions, and end up maintaining the organization, but at the price of its central goals. So this is the great. This is the great. This is this is the origin of goal displacement uh, uh, in 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 in, or, in organization in organization uh, theory. And so one uh, one sees it. Uh, one sees uh, one sees it uh, there. Now I don't know whether did did I don't think Michelle won in this. There's just no iron law of oligarchy so much as the reverse of the the iron law of frittering away power in order to in order to preserve a, a variety of interests and 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 as a result the institution survives at the expense. Of its, at the expense of its of its uh, of its uh, uh, mission. Uh, now, the next two books seem to respond to what went wrong in TVA. And the next one is a case study. And incidentally, almost all that well, all of his three organization books follow the same pattern. Uh, it's a case study in which he. Uh, 
explores in depth with ethnography and interviews and all sorts of things. And then he wants to generalize very broadly from it. So it's a, he, he, he looks at a microscope on one, on, at one moment and a telescope on the next, goes back and forth. And, and it seems to me it's a great model for, uh, uh, for, for good research. And it seems to me that that's what a lot of RecNet uh, 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 studies uh, do it, uh, in one way. Uh, certainly my, my colleague Bob Kagan's uh, uh, RecNet inspired work. Um, okay, the next book is a book of successful leadership, but it's a, it's a study of it's a study of the Communist Party. It's called the Organizational Weapon. This is an institution, an organization, namely the Communist Party, that doesn't have the problems that that uh, the TVA did, because the leaders are adept at maintaining. Uh, 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 their followers' commitment to the mission and disciplining uh, them such that uh, such that they they, they, they they follow they follow pretty well. So you have two case studies of organizations. One one that's unsuccessful, the great democratic experiment in 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 uh, in, uh, in, in the United States, and the other is successful, uh, which is the Communist uh, Party experiment of disciplined uh, of disciplined membership to pursue to pursue goals. At any at any rate, uh, that's uh, that, that that that's sort of an irony. And in the next book, Philip wants to wants to marry those two things together, uh, and 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 tries to say what are the lessons of leadership that can be used for good rather than for bad, and 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 that that's, that's his last book. And I'm blocking on the name of the. These were not inspired titles he had. Exactly. Leadership and administration. Le leadership and administration. And so and so and so and so uh, and so there he there he uh, uh, there he, uh, he 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 does it now. Here's a problem. I've always had this. I've always had this, and now I have an opportunity to put it to Martin on the, uh, uh, you know, in front of, the, of an audience. He's on record. Uh, Philip's commitment to s turning organizations into institutions—that is, that is, vital organizations that have a sense of a mission that animate their followers—has, to some significant effect. I think some sort of mystical or quasi-mystical and religious quality. That is, the successful leader is the is the uh, the uh, uh, you know is is the religious leader. I once I once uh, I once uh, sort of ribbed uh, Philip and said uh, you should have been a rabbi, and he said no, a priest. And I think that probably right. Rabbis don't get lots of respect or enough respect, but priests, uh, priests, uh, well, maybe not recently, but historically, they've gotten, they've gotten, they've gotten quite a bit. So maybe, maybe, maybe he was right. But I think, I think that, I think that, I think that, uh, that, that, that's, that's right. And I think this goes back to. I'll just circle back to the point I made a moment ago. Sheldon Wolin, again, my, another of an old colleague of sorts at, 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 at Berkeley criticized uh, Philip's uh, 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 book, uh, uh, work, for not having a politics and, he, and for eliding sociology and, 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 and politics t together and, in a sense, to promote, to promote uh, managerialism uh, rather than more robust politics. And I think that's right. If you look in the index, to take one example, uh, 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 and look under labor unions, uh, there, uh, if you look under L, there is nothing about labor union in, in your index. Nor, and that doesn't reflect you. That reflects that reflects him, I think, to a large extent. And, and and similarly, there's not a whole lot about political parties. And so, so there's a, it's, it's a curious. He has been accused, and and Martin defends him. I think. I think, okay, he has been accused of being in the tradition of sociology, a consensus sociologist rather than a, rather than a conflict sociologist. And if you think about it, organizations are organized around central missions and quests, and law is, around, uh, is also uh, organized around, around, around central themes. So, so perhaps, perhaps there is a, oh, thank you very much, uh, perhaps there is, perhaps there is, uh, there is, uh, there is, there is, there is uh, something, something to those criticisms. And th th that's, uh, those are issues I'd like you to elaborate on, uh, 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 Martin. Let me turn to uh, his sociology of law in the, in the remaining uh, couple of minutes here, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be briefer. And, and that is, he, here he has two big books and one incendiary article. And, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, 
uh, let, let me say uh, something about this. Uh, uh, Philip turned his attention to law in the 1950s, and then it kept, kept developing, and it created the institutions of which I'm a part now at Berkeley, and many of you, some of you have visited, and so on. Uh, and sociology of law is a natural extension of his interest in organization theory, because law is another way to, uh, to uh, uh, turn energy into an institution that has values, that has a commitment, that has a, that has a mission, that has a, a normative uh, component to it that, again, is constrained exercise of power, just as a good organization would be a constrained uh, 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 effort at uh, exercising uh, uh, power. Uh, and uh, and again, it, it's again, it's another law. Uh, a, a lawful regime is another way of, of of countering tyranny, while at the same time organizing to uh, organ and restraining power. At the same time, it is uh, to, uh, to to uh, uh, to engage in collective 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 uh, 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 action. So so he, he he sees these he sees these same the same features and the same uh, sort of characteristics or or benefits he sees from from organizations as institutions. It's an important addition to turn an organization into an institution. He sees he sees in uh, he sees in, uh, in in this. By this, he's saying both organizations and law are eminent institutions. That is, you can only understand them by understanding not their teleology, but by understanding their mission, their aspiration. Right? So in a sense, the, 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 the whole is larger than the, the sum of its parts. Now, incidentally, I have to say, uh, the philosopher of science that told me this is not a good way for social scientists to think about was none other than May Broadbeck, who was, who was uh, Philip's sister and my, uh, my uh, philosophy of uh, social science instructor at the University of Minnesota in 1960. 66. And so I, I asked Philip if he ever if he ever talked to his sister because they were they were diametrically imposed in their the ways they thought about social. In fact, is they had been separated as kids and they really didn't talk to each other very much over their over their adult lives. But at any rate, both both distinguished the smart people. But uh, but at any at any rate uh, at any rate he has he has this view that says you cannot understand the law or an institution or a family or a university without understanding its mission. You have to understand what is in people's heads. You can't simply understand the behavior. Now, he got into a lot of trouble like the, for, for saying this in, in, I think, purposefully incendiary form in his, in his, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, argument on, on sociology and, and natural law because he didn't have to say any of those things at all to, to make the same point, since it's, it's, not a, it's not a distinct point to him. But, but he turned this into the study of normative institutions, like law, he says, is close to the study of, of, of natural law. You have to, you have to appreciate uh, natural law. Now, later he did, in fact, embrace some natural law-like like, uh, like things, but, but, uh, but uh, uh, he wanted to understand the compelling normative, the com the compelling nature of a normative system that sought to restrain power, and 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 he looks at that in he looks at that in in uh, in, uh, in, in in two books. The first one is Law, Society, and Industrial Justice. Uh, one of the big sort of uh, a big book that set the scene for the the, the Berkeley uh, Berkeley Sociology of Law project that continues today, and and then and then and then a book and a, and a book sometime uh, uh, later with with uh, with his our co our colleague uh, Philippe Nonet, uh, Law uh, 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 Law and Society in in in, in, in transition transition. In Law Society and Industrial Justice, he celebrates law and the imposition or the importing of law into industrial organizations. It's a good book. You can't argue, at least I can't argue with very much of it. But I must say that when I read it, I wonder where labor unions are. He celebrates law and the consensual nature of law, after all, this is where you find common ground, to the robust nature of that, uh, the, the robust nature of, of, uh, of, 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 of union, union politics. Uh, I once was at a, at a meeting where, where uh, uh, Philip uh, uh, and uh, Lon Fuller uh, uh, were the two, uh, two people on the panel. It was wonderful. I remember going up after, uh, afterwards and asking, uh, 
uh, uh, asking uh, the same question of both of them, and I got quite different answers. I, I ask, I ask uh, Philip why the sociologist sounded like a philosopher, and I ask the philosopher why <laughs> the philosopher sounded like a sociologist. And Fuller said, "I'm really a sociologist," and 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 and, and Philip was a little perplexed to me. But he does seem to talk like uh, every he speak and write sometimes right like like the ordinary law is good and the and more law is better. And, 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 and Fuller, as you know, uh, uh, was always interested in you know, how far a law could go before it, 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 uh, before it overextended itself and, and, and couldn't solve the problems it set out to solve or where it impoverished relations. So Fuller was always looking at the boundaries of law and, 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 uh, and Philip saw no boundaries that, so far as I could see. Tell me when I'm wrong on that too. Uh, <laughs> And then in Law and Society in Transition, this is the one, this, his, his last big book on, on, on law is where he argues, he and, 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 and Philippe uh, uh, try to stand back and take and, and, and make a, uh, and, 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 and come to grips with uh, uh, law in its larger historical, historical uh, sweep, sweep. And here too, and here he, here he, he really does develop, I guess, a natural law, certainly an evolutionary scheme uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, is like everything he says. Philip says one thing one time and then he, and then he modifies it the next. So he's, I mean, Philip is any, he was anything but doctrinaire and he rec recognized the variability of social life. In fact, wanted, you know, urged us all to go study that variation. Uh, but but, uh, but he, do he does, Construct an idea, a legal system that's something like something like a, you know like a, like a, a sense of the mind, at least a, the, the sort of the pre-physiologist notion of sense of the mind of stages of development, of say the moral development of Piaget or Kohlberg and so on. And so he developed a they developed a theory of a three-stage set of, of law from uh, from uh, from repressive law. You know the first the first order of any legal system is to create stability and order. Uh, the next stage internal to that is to is to tame repression by separating law from politics uh, or uh, and insisting on procedure that uh, that will that will limit that will limit power that's called autonomous law and then uh, a third one that he goes back and says it's a bit like repressive law but it's for it's for good not for bad it's for uh, it's 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 really it's really regnet it's responsive regulation and restorative justice and and uh, and uh, and it's to use law to use law for a benefit now, in a review I wrote many years ago, after which I said I'll never get a job at Berkeley, uh, I criticized them for saying that law was too protean and had too many, too many, too many uh, dimensions, uh, too many facets. Uh, a criminal, you know, a system that has criminal law and has contracts and it has, and it, and it, ha and it has uh, estates and trusts and it has uh, uh, property and everything else, and it could be they can be moving in in, in different directions. I think here. Uh, Philip, uh, I think they lacked. It's hard to say. These guys are giants, but I, I do think they they, they lacked either a, 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 a sufficient hist historical and comparative uh, uh, perspective here. Uh, I think they were responding too much to the chaos of the 1960s, and and on Berkeley campus there was a lot of it, and also to the Warren Court, uh, the great uh, 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 judicial activism of the Warren. In fact, when they're talking about law. Almost all their examples are constitutional law. I mean, they're a particular type of law. It's not real law. That constitutional law is something else. And 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 so I think they I think they uh, I, I think they 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 fail to uh, they they fail to appreciate the the great variety of law. More generally, I think I think they uh, and again they're preoccupied with law limiting power. And I think uh, I think a more historical. Perspective or a broader take would have would have been to to explore the facilitative uh, effects. Now they they do the, do that, and that is that is uh, that is uh, responsive law, I, I suppose to 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 a, to a point. But again, they're, they're, all their examples, almost all of them, come from constitutional law. Uh, there's nothing about ordinary law. Let me give one example. Even as the Warren Court was expanding the notion of equality, what was it doing in criminal procedure? Insisting that the 
T's be crossed and the I's be dotted. That was, they wanted autonomous law in one area and they wanted responsive law in another. But even, even more generally, uh, by equating law with constitutional law, they ignore a variety of other things. Think of the, the greatest expansive form of responsive law I can think of in at least modern history is the common law in the 19th century. They're silent on that. I mean, there was a complete revolution, judge-made law in the 19th century that, that creates law, that takes feudal law and transforms it from, you know, from status to contract uh, so that modern institutions can exist. Uh, silent on that. And, and, and so, so this isn't some peculiar product of late modernity as they, as, as responsive law, as, as, they, as, they, as, they, as they seem to do. Secondly, it seems to me they may have been tied up, and here I'm going to gore your ox, it seems to me that they, uh, uh, like Martin, are, are tied to a very conventional no, notion of the rule of law, sort of a Dworkinian notion of the rule of law, that says that law, that, that, uh, the, that the rule of law requires officials to operate under a pre-existing set of rules or principles that they have to interpret uh, to, to apply their job. Now, I, think, I don't think courts have ever done that. Uh, and I, I certainly don't think administrative agencies do that. Modern courts are, both constitutional and non-constitutional, are like administrative agencies. They take various rules, not to interpret them and apply them and be constrained by them, but rather they take them as grants of jurisdiction. Modern law, and certainly administrative agencies do that. Uh, they, they, you know, there's a problem. It's a, and here are the components of it. You go tell us what the, what the solution is to it and then enforce it. So it's a grant, but I think, I think courts have done that. I, I finished a big book a few years ago with my colleague Ed Rubin on prison conditions litigation. Uh, the courts, the trial, American federal trial courts took the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And they didn't interpret that. There had been no interpretation. And if you look, if they were trying to interpret anything, they would have to run up against the 13th Amendment that says, in part, that convicted felons can be slaves. That is, not everyone was, not everyone was freed after the Civil War. Uh, the court just ignored that. They took, the, they, they took the, the, the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment as a, as a grant of jurisdiction to make policy, simply to make policy not constrained by the rule of law. And I think that happens again and again and again. And I think uh, uh, Philip's concern with law being used to restrain power uh, doesn't allow him to appreciate just how much, how much law or legal institutions, maybe they're acting illegally or, or extra-legally, uh, in fact, in fact uh, are bound and constrained not by uh, uh, rules of law, but rather by social conventions. The reason that the court could, could reconstruct a prison overnight is because there was a model of what a good prison was, and because by the time they got around to thinking about prisoners, they said, you know, uh, people in the military have rights, black people have rights, students have rights, why shouldn't prisoners have rights? So those were the constraints on the court. The constraints were not, were not uh, were, they, that is, they were the social constraints, institutional constraints, not, not the constraints of the rule of law. And I think, uh, I think Philip has, uh, and, 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 and Philippe in, in, in this book, failed to appreciate uh, uh, just how protean uh, uh, that law was. Uh, I'm going to shut up. I've gone way over my time. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, and I hope, I've, uh, I, I hope I've, I've, I've conveyed two things, that this is a fantastic book. It's a book that could be read as a text. You ought to have your students read it with great profit. And, 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 and it's done by a master craftsman in the name of Martin Krieger. If there are a few shortcomings here and there, part of those are Phillips and part of them, uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> 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 well, uh, uh, Martin's done a, a great service to Philip Selznick with, with the rich texture yeah, yeah, of the yeah. uh, exegesis in this book. One of the admirable things about Selznick is that he's, he's always been an unfashionable scholar. His work didn't fit snugly in, in one box, and so contemporary scholars don't read him very much because they see themselves as 
setting it uh, in one or the other fields in which he, he worked. His deeper importance is as an interdisciplinary scholar uh, who traverses the fields in which he worked as a thinker, uh, as a thinker about the fate of values in the world. What are virtuous values? and what threatens and sustains them politically, legally, institutionally. Uh, it's a good idea for all of us who work in the fields in which we work to read The Moral Commonwealth, in particular uh, that book. But it's a, it's a book, it's a big book. A strength of his work is how multi-layered it is. Uh, some of that book is, is undisciplined and there are, are too many uh, layers. There could have been some some ruthless uh, editing and therefore my advice to people now would be to read Martin's book rather than to, <laughs> rather than to read good. the original because he really has cut through all the unnecessarily messy bits and not only captured the essence of that uh, great book but all the other books and some other interesting bits of intellectual biography about Trotskyism etc. Um, Martin and Selznick uh, both had the virtue of intellectuals who roam freely across multiple fields. Martin quotes uh, Max Weber as saying, I am not a donkey, I don't have a field. Um, which made me think of uh, another donkey story. Actually, Martin suggested I edit out a couple of my donkey stories, so I'll just do one more, uh, one more donkey story, which is uh, of an Afghan proverb of a wise old man who's riding his donkey in a beautiful green springtime valley as the snows are melting down into the Afghan valley, and a child says to him, Wise old man, where are you going? And he serenely looks about the country, beautiful countryside and says, I don't know, ask the donkey. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I'll cut the, the next donkey narrative, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is actually slightly more relevant than, uh, than that one, but, but not, nearly as, not nearly as good. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, tolerance of ambi ambiguity in Selznick's uh, scholarship. His, critique, his communitarian critique of liberalism as pathologically atomistic, while being a liberal himself, his commitment to taking rights seriously, while being a critic of rights discourse as, to quote Martin's elegant way of putting it, rights discourse as allowing too much of a good thing to trump other good things. His commitment to checks and balances and to power taming power. His responsive law is more problem-centred than rule-centred, more persuasive than coercive. So the influence of Selznick here is not just on things like uh, responsive regulation and on uh, uh, Bardock and Kagan's work on going by the book. It's also on problem-oriented policing and a lot more. His commitment to civility and piety. Piety, very unfashionable. Martin says, as civility governs diversity, protects autonomy and upholds toleration, piety expresses de devotion and demands integration. Martin, he's such a great writer, he writes of Selznick's civility in these words. Civility is not one of those ideals that quickens the pulse. It might, however, steady it. Another rich vein that I like very much is the way that both Martin and Selznick defend conservatism. Though I don't think even Selznick is as unfashionable as Martin in using conservative as a descriptor of one aspect of their scholarship. Martin says, existing values, cultures, traditions, institutions, practices help us make our way in a world so complex and fraught with risk, uncertainty, that we need all the help we can get. The conservative critique, for example, is deftly deployed by both Martin and Selznick to critique Foucault as unable to distinguish between, quote, discipline that gives coherence to life 
and sustains autonomous projects uh, distinguished from techniques of control that regiment, denude, degrade. I admire the integration of normative and explanatory theory in Selznick and the way Martin's prose captures it better than Selznick's. This is Selznick's engagement with American philosophical pragmatism, his shared thinking with Dewey about the integration of means and ends, and about learning through experience how to discover paths to normative value. Now my main theoretical critique of Selznick to balance uh, these many and great virtues, some of which I've trimmed back, Martin agrees with me and with Malcolm, I think, uh, that the evolutionary aspects of Selznick's theory that he holds very dear are implausible. A natural evolution from repressive to autonomous to responsive law is so unconvincing. Selznick doesn't discuss societies that had restorative and responsive institutions of indigenous law that worked well for them, that was then replaced by autonomous law at the moment of transition to independence, to be then replaced by coercive law as coups and dictators corrupted autonomous law. Exactly the opposite of evolution to that posited by Selznick is common in human history. His historical engagement with those processes is thin and myopically Western. There's certainly a need to solve the Hobbesian problem before you can have Lockean liberalism. But that doesn't uh, mean, as Selznick argues, that you have to have coercive, a, a, a phase of coercive law in history before you can have autonomous law. And here I think Martin is a bit uh, uh, charitable uh, to, uh, uh, to Selznick. And as, as evidence uh, of of that, I would cite uh, the, uh, the book club that we had last year, which Martin was one of the contributors, the Wilt, Wilt Mason Collection on Law in Afghanistan, which I could read as being an argument for why the bits of Af Afghanistan that are resorting to responsive forms of law are doing a better job at the rule of law than those bits of it that are relying upon coercive law. So I think there's a tension between that project, and Wilt Mason was one of Martin's PhD students, that project that you're involved in in this one, and I would have imported a bit more of that uh, uh, in here. So let, let me make the point by just telling a story, which is not a story from, from that collection. But when I was in Afghanistan, there was uh, an, an incident in Taha province uh, where uh, a night raid had assassinated uh, an Uzbek mullah and two women who were seen to be his followers. The belief of the, this province is largely Uzbek, more Uzbeks than anyone else, and but lots of Tajiks as well. But the Tajiks control the power structure. Tajiks are governed, the, gov the governors are Tajik, the police uh, uh, commander is uh, Tajik. And the Uzbek community believed that these folk were, were assassinated because uh, he was a threat to the Tajik power structure of the, not to say the Tajik police commissioner had given this intelligence to the NATO forces to go in and kill uh, these guys to eliminate the political opposition, something that happens quite a bit uh, in Afghanistan. There was a, an Uzbek riot in response. It wasn't a Taliban riot. The young German soldiers who had been trained in counterterrorism, but not in riot control, panicked, opened fire on the mob. Uh, 75 were wounded and 12 were killed. Then there was another hasty response because the security situation deteriorated uh, so quickly. The Taliban used it to argue that the two, bit, uh, two women, then the Taliban did come in after the riot, 
uh, and, and, and argued that the two women were raped by American forces who were with the nativists. That was not, not true, but that whipped up the security situation to become even worse. Uh, then, so they hastily, in response, uh, convened a, a high-level peace conference. Taliban managed to harness the resentment to get one of the delegates to the peace conference to take a bomb in. A bomb was ignited in the conference, killed General Dowd, the northern police commander for all Afghanistan, a couple of German soldiers, the hated Tajik police commander, some other police commanders, and uh, the uh, northern NATO commander, a German general, was also very badly wounded in the incident. But because the Tajik leaders were then killed, then the further bad escalation of the security situation in the province. So I was there at a meeting with the number two UN guy with the Provincial Peace Council and uh, with, on which there were representatives of the Taliban, of the Uzbek elders and of the Tajik elders of the province. And the Uzbek uh, leaders are saying, look, uh, these people and the, our people are particularly upset about the innocent women. Uh, the UN leader says, <coughs> we believe our intelligence, the NATO intelligence, was right. Uh, this, you know, this mosque was a base for insurgency. And these two women were sewing vests for suicide, who were killed, were sewing vests for suicide bombers. To which the Uzbek leader responded, well, uh, I don't think you're right on that. I think you've just been sold a line by the Tajik leadership of the province who are here and can speak for themselves on this matter. But let's assume for a moment you are right. Is the rule of law that you are bringing to our province one where an appropriate response to the allegation of sewing women sewing suicide vests is their assassination without, uh, without uh, trial. And that was a kind of a hard question for him to answer. And as he was struggling to deal with it, he said, wouldn't a better response have been for you to come to our local shura where we deal with allegations of this kind and where Uzbeks and Tajiks can come together and argue these things through. That is to say, a responsive, you know, restorative and responsive legal framework might have prevented this whole deterioration. Now, I think you would agree with, you know, there, in the book that I'm referring to, there's more systematic treatment of many stories of that, uh, of that kind. So, the best solution to the Hobbesian problem is generally a responsive one, not a coercive one. So that. And I think that's a very dangerous argument uh, that needs to be focused on as a, as a, as a priority. Okay. Um, while individual, and, and, and Selznick's naturalism also goes too far. While individual organisms grow, mature, there's no such imminent tendency for organisations to do so. There's no naturalness in the evolutionary growth of organisations and institutions. We can identify the biological mechanisms that cause an acorn to grow into an oak tree. Markets is one interesting candidate of a mechanism of that kind, paradoxically through creative destruction of organisations. Uh, th there's an argument that markets cause surviving organisations to mature and develop and and as a liberal, uh, Selznick does buy into that kind of argument. And that might seem to the eyes of a hopeful liberal like Selznick to mimic natural evolution. Selznick concedes that markets are regula regularly corrupt corrupted, but markets being corrupted is not the big problem. Markets being markets is uh, the the really big problem, I want to argue. The very forces that promote what Selznick sees as evolutionary growth in institutions also drive regressive institutions. Just as markets drive the more efficient production of goods, 
They also drive the more efficient production of bads. Markets in heroin, tobacco, fatty foods, gambling, all deliver the more efficient production of dangerous and unnatural addictions. So my own work on markets in vice, markets in virtue, could be read as a critique of the evo this ev evolutionary aspect of Selznick's theory. Markets in financial engineering, in particular, pose a deep threat to the very liberal communitarian capitalism that Selznick values as a virtuous, responsive kind of capitalist evolution. We see on the streets of Greece today the voices of fascist and communist immoderation that Selznick so learned to fear in his lifetime. Those voices were given breath by markets in vice, by Lehman Brothers financial engineering to conceal the Greek national debt, by misguided quantitative modelling of risk management as pioneered by one of Merton's other progeny, Selznick was a student of Merton, uh, his Nobel laureate uh, in economic son, Robert Merton. So for mine, there's no evolutionary imminence toward natural institution, institutional growth or for a discoverable natural law. Peter Drahosch's work shows well how autonomous and responsive intellectual property law has become a vehicle of one of the greatest tyrannies of redistribution from the poor to the rich in the world system. Markets in vice will always be a threat to our survival. Today, the market for selling drones is delivering new waves of assassinations of political leaders that will pose a threat of nuclear war when India or Pakistan first uses a drone to assassinate the president of, of the other, or when Russia first fires a hellfire, hellfire missile into the Oval Office. It's in the nature of capitalism that just as markets in goods gain new ascendancies, so do markets in bads. Particular kinds of markets in bads, markets in new forms of violence delivery, new forms of environmental destruction, and markets in new technologies that the rich can purchase to redistribute wealth from the poor to the rich, such as new forms of financial engineering around regulatory and redistributive laws. And of course, markets in vote buying. Markets in lobbying that see the prize go to the firm that can pay the biggest lobbyist fees. These corrupt uh, uh, democracy uh, in ways that mean that uh, Wall Street is favoured over Main Street, as the Americans say. Far from evolutionary hopefulness about the imminence of natural law and development the forces of ruling class tyranny are structurally more likely to be in the ascendancy most of the time. And Martin does warn us about this. The remedy, in various ways, the remedy is continuous struggle against those dominating forces for a more struggle for a more equal society, a less violent society, a more environmentally responsive society. Otherwise, we social democrats will allow the liberals and the libertarians to pander to the potentialities for liberalism to destroy itself at the hands of markets in bad. Markets in virtue have less capacity to save us than markets in vice have to destroy us. So the factory can produce goods for us that were not available in previous centuries. But factory farming also allows the ruling species to tyrannise animals in ways that were not possible in pre-modern times. It allowed the factories of murder that we saw in the Holocaust. It allows factories of slavery of human beings pressed by institutions of debt into their factory slavery. If there is an imminence about the development of human institutions, these factories are its face. Shall I finish there or go for another two minutes? Probably finish there. Right. <laughs> well, I should tell you that in the next two minutes, uh, Selznick gets uh, compared unfavourably with Neil Gunningham. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I thought I should make it. Well, both great, but cutting them a bit greater. This gives a sense of the plausibility of the enterprise. Uh, well, I, well, thank you both. I can only think of one thing that could compare with listening to respected colleagues speak warmly about a book that's occupied a lot of your life, and that would be listening to the uh, eulogies at your funeral. So people say such nice things on such occasions, and I'm grateful for the ones being said here, and uh, I look forward to the ones there. But <laughs> at the moment, I'll just start at the, at the other end. Uh, in February, I was in Oxford, uh, and I was to give a paper on, funnily enough, Philip Selznick, and I uh, was reading the proofs of this book on February the 9th, and it's a significant day for me, and I discovered that there was a sentence missing from the last page of the book, and I wrote quickly to the copy editor and asked, could it possibly be saved and reinstated? And she said she'd try, but it was going to be hard, it was late in the day, and I said, look, I understand all that, uh, but you've got to understand that if this sentence doesn't get in, the whole book uh, is, is finished, and it's my birthday. <laughs> and uh, she d d said she'd do what I, she said in America, she said, you're playing very hard ball. And at midnight, literally at midnight, I got an email from the printer saying, happy birthday, but if you have any other wise suggestions, keep them for the second edition. Uh, <laughs> that was a hopeful remark, but uh, the, the, the sentence, which I should reveal, is the one that, that John quoted from Muggs Weber, uh, that he's not a donkey and he doesn't have a field. And it came in the course of a, the, a sort of mild polemic at the end of my book, where I... Uh, I consider the eugenic, if I ask whether a Selznick or something like him is a likely product of modern universities, and I can suggest that he's not, and partly I attribute that to the eugenic effects of uh, trends in the modern hyper-professionalised, hyper-specialised, hyper-technicised university, and before this sentence, uh, which I use just to lighten the discourse, I've <laughs> quoted Weber's, uh, Weber's Weib, uh, famous lament that the world might be filled with these uh, sensualist without spirit, specialist without heart, this nullity imagined that it's attained a level of civilization unknown before. And I thought, well, having hit them with that, I should bring the <laughs> things up. But uh, now, of course, Weber and Selznick did have fields, they had many fields, but they were very suspicious of boundary, boundary crossing and, uh, sorry, of boundary protectors. And uh, they would cross them freely driven, in both cases, by the character of the problem that they were engaged in rather than the disciplinary hat that they wore. Both of them felt very strongly that they came from disciplines, but they were systematically, and in uh, Selznick's place, per case perhaps evangelically, committed to ecumenical views, as he put it, of his work. And th this following where the problem leads was a problem for me because when I... Uh, suggested the book to the press, it was to be a little book on his sociology of law. And then as I got into him, I came to believe very quickly that everything connects with everything else in Selznick and that you had to do everything, so this is everything. And, but it's everything also in a, in a different sense. Philippe Nonet, his once disciple, uh, said that those who come to Philip's work seeking a, comp a contribution to sociology of organizations, industrial sociology, sociology of law, social philosophy, will find something, in fact they'll find a lot, but they'll miss everything that matters. Philippe has a tendency to exaggerate more than I do because racial, ethnic difference. Uh, <laughs> and I think they'll just miss lots that matter. And I was very quickly, uh, I came to believe that I, I realised that this is what had drawn me to. I had no interest in the TVA, no interest in American industrial relations. I had a great deal of interest in Trotskyism and, and, uh, the, and communist strategy, but this was, these were sidelines in the major game. What I was won by were features of his cast of mind, his mind, his cast of mind, and also a particular sensibility. And I spend a lot of time 
trying. I try, they're within the particulars and they spill over from the particulars and I try faithfully, loyally, I hope, to convey the particulars and given that he moved from field to field in roughly chronological order, so does the book. But my main ambition is to try to convey this cast of mind and sensibility, which I... Uh, which has many aspects. One of them is what he used to call his generalizing impulse. Apart from his sociology text, he wrote the best-selling sociology text in America for over 30 years, and apart from that and the moral commonwealth, all his books were focused on a particular subject, TVA, communist strategy, uh, industrial relations, American industrial relations. But very quickly you get the feeling that this is a book to be read many times for many things, that it has always its layered, and there are always this, the empirical research where he did it uh, was done for larger, with larger ambitions and on larger scale. And of course those ambitions which have been spoken about uh, in varying tones of praise and blame in the last few minutes, his central cohering problem I suspect he didn't know it as a problem when he began, but looking back on his work, he saw that this is what uh, connected the very many various and distinct, in other people's works, bodies of, or disciplines and, and subjects. The thing that connected it was a concern to uh, explore the fate of values in the light of, in the, in the course of, social processes. And that led him uh, to it led him inexorably, but it didn't, wouldn't lead everybody inexorably, to develop this uh, ecumenical view of what he was about. If you were interested in the fate of values, you had to know something more than sociologists typically did about values. That would lead you to moral philosophy. But what do moral philosophers know about the world? We're told they live in it, but they very rarely do anything which shows any systematic or direct or or considered acquaintance with it. So you have to bolster that by looking at the fate of values. This is not an airy phrase. It sounds airy the way we're talking about it until you get to the nitty gritty. The fate of values in the world means particular values in particular places, in particular institutions. The famous article that, well, it's famous at this table anyway, the famous article that, uh, that Malcolm mentioned, Sociology and Natural Law, I think he didn't quite capture part of the uh, the central argument there, which was an attempt to soften up sociological opposition to take philosophical problems and questions seriously, or moral ones in any case. He said later at some stage that our best minds uh, don't know what to do with, our keenest minds in the social sciences didn't know what to do with an ideal except handle it gingerly and view it with alarm. And he said this was, this was a mistake because in the standard operating stuff, of sociology, you would find you were constantly confronted with the need to explore and understand what he called normative practices. Fatherhood and par parenthood is a normative practice, law is a normative practice. These are social practices which are not adequately described without taking account of their tendency to evaluation. Their uh, socialization can be thought of in sociology as a neutral term, but we know that there is dysfunctional socialization. There is uh, there is good socialization, or at least we talk in that language, and Selznick wanted to, uh, to uh, take seriously and deepen our ability to come to, uh, to recognize and to speak to the, the fate of values in the world. There are matters of sensibility at a general level too. I've called one his Hobbesian idealism, that is the constant and systematically connected attention to things that endanger and things which might allow flourishing of values in the world. That's an enterprise which is terribly easy to say, but people don't do it. It's temperamentally hard. You have Hobbesians and you have idealists. It's rare to have Hobbesian idealists, and he was one in, I think, an exemplary and attractive manner. And then I talk also about, it's true that he was coherent, and if you read him the way that he can be read, since he lived so long, this was very bad for his career. An agent could have told him that this was a mistake, and it clearly was a mistake. If he had popped off at the age of 50, leaving TVA, leadership and administration, etc., he his fame would have lasted. But he kept going on, he kept writing, till he was 89. His last book uh, was published 
then, this is a terrible career move, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, I apologize on his behalf. But the coherence that you see, that you can find, you can find this coherence quickly, but it's not a simple coherence. It's a developing one. That is, he has fundamental problems, big problems. He keeps coming back to them. He modifies his views. He asks different questions about them. So this combination of coherence and development seems to me admirable and important. Uh, and finally, the integrity which he manifested, which I have something to say about uh, in, the, in the book and which I'll have you take on faith. So, general, now to a couple of criticisms. I would have liked some more engagement with that larger level because I think that these books, uh, many of them are uh, apt for criticism. They're particular books on particular subjects, that's true. And uh, on some of them, particularly the old ones, they've had a lot of time for people to think different thoughts. But let me, since I'm not sure that I'm here in what, in what uh, um, persona I'm here, whether I'm here as Krieger or Selznick, let me be Selznick a little, just to at least defend or comment on, on some of them. Malcolm talks about the al absence of politics in some sustained way in his work. And I think that's ultimately true. I think it is ultimately true, and I say something about it in the book in response to Wolin. It wasn't always true. He was, after all, not just a Trotskyist in New York City, but a leader and a union organizer, the Joe Hill unit in New York City. He was a polemicist. He once went for a debate, and he thought it was Irving Howe, and he could cream him, but it turned out to be Max Schachtman, who was the oratorical genius leader of his faction of, of when he was splitting from Trotskyism. He was a bit paled by that. He did have strong political commitments all his life, and he had strong political thinking at the beginning of his intellectually active life. And the book that you mentioned, which no one reads, it's a wonderful book, The Organisational Weapon, is a deeply politically informed book, politically wise, but also politically canny. He knows a great deal about organizational strategy of revolutionary parties, and, and he displays it. Uh, but it's true that the books which got academic um, uh, acclaim were in a way that Sheldon Wolin, in a celebrated and brilliant uh, critique in his book Politics and Vision, captured. Wolin takes Selznick to represent the sort of culmination of a world historical trend in Europe which has emptied politics from, uh, emptied our understanding of politics. Politics is the concern with the general values of the community, the general concerns of the community, has been decentered, de dissipated, uh, diffused, so there's nothing of it left. And Selznick, with his concern, not only for administrative organizations at that time, but with the argument that within those administrative organizations there are real politics, is decentering, taking politics from its rehome and then dissipating it throughout the society. Selznick replies intelligently to the critique, but he never does say why he doesn't come back to what he knows is there, after all, central political activity. I think partly it is that he is a plural, it's, it may not come through strongly enough in the book because I'm not one of these, but he always saw himself as sociology incarnate, the discipline incarnate. He wanted, he, he didn't like the way things were going, he wanted to suggest different ways in which sociology and ecumenical sociology could be redirected, re but Sociology, this notion that society was the center of the action was fundamental for him. And he spent much of his life, when he's talking about organizations, he's an organizational political pluralist. That is, you find politics wherever you look. In ordinary, the political, the, the leader of an organization is a statesman, he says. The leader, not the manager, not the guy who gets things to tick over. He has wonderfully resonant passages about universities, which could be you know, when a, a university can tick over in all sorts of ways, but if it doesn't know what it's about, or if you don't know what a university is about, if you haven't recognized and nurtured the latent values, the implicit imminent values of this institution, then, uh, then something fundamental is lost. But the leader, as he uh, 
understand the particular role of a leader concerned with infusing values into, uh, into an institution. This is a person who's involved in many of the fundamental tasks of politics. So it's not so much that he ignores politics, but he uh, dis does displace it, partly uh, intentionally. The religious, the religious is interesting. I know he always told me he was not religious, not musically, he's not religiously musical. And I think that's true. He was not religiously musical to any particular faith. Uh, he saw, he read a lot of religion, or a lot of religious and theological texts in many religions. And part, his story about that was that he was looking for people who had pondered significant problems of the human condition, and religions had done that. But not because he had, as he called it, God hunger. He claimed he never had that. But there was, increasingly in later life, something which I never understood, and I was never long enough there to try to make sense of it, because for me it would need making sense, a kind of prophetic part of his scholarly ambition. That is, I'll say something in a moment about the, the uh, evolutionary character of, of some of his claims, but often you felt, as you felt with many of the great uh, prophets, that whatever you were talking about, you're at the penultimate stage. Marx was in capitalism, uh, and he had a certainty that there would be certain, the ultimate stage. Now, Selznick was much more nuanced than this. He, none of it, and there should have been, I, th I think, uh, in, in, I think we've overdone his commitment to evolution. He has a great deal to say about uh, history takes its course. It's all sorts of things can throw you off. So what's he doing with evolution? If you look from the very beginning, when he was a Trotskyist, he, uh, I'm not sure if there is any coherence in this. I felt, as I was waiting, I felt, when I drove down, I was listening to rugby league commentary. And people kept saying, this team has set plays. But they only use their set plays every now and again. So. In a sense, uh, as I was listening to these comments, I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to use too many of the set plays, so we'll just see where it goes. Uh, but when he was a Trotskyist, he came on to a book which had enormous influence on him for much of his life at different levels, and that was Robert, Robert Michel's Political Parties. Incidentally, if you looked up political <laughs> parties in the index, you would have found parties there. Uh, Michel's famously argued that there was an iron law of oligarchy uh, by which, which, would, uh, which would corrupt any organization, even the most de democratic. It was an imminent law. It was a law of imminent development. This was a shock with the, among Marxists who had no laws of imminent development of organizations. They had class development, etc. Everything was outside. Inside organizations, they had no story. And Selznick picked up Michel's and used it first as his major, as a critical Marxist, to criticize the kind of unfounded, ungrounded, unserious for him idealism of people who wouldn't take seriously the organizational and institutional challenges to the achievement of their ambitions. So when he was looking to do a doctorate, he uh, came across statements by the head of the TVA that this would solve the Michel's problem because while the government would be in the federal centre, administration would be uh, uh, put down to the grassroots. Selznick's book is called TVA and the Grassroots. And he came into this, he's a young, uh, young smart ass, as he said to me. He said, well, I know that's wrong. All the power will go to the top. And he went out to Tennessee. And he found, as Malcolm said, the opposite of what he expected. That is, that in trying to co-opt locals for this federally directed uh, institution, the leaders of the TVA had given away the farm. So in that way, it's the opposite of, of uh, Michel's. But at a larger level, that imminent developments have to be taken, care, taken account of and care of by anybody who wants to be serious about the uh, institutionalization of ideals. That's a fundamental lesson that he never left. And where, what it got him doing, and he never had any meta-reflection about this, but it's fundamental to understanding some of the things that you criticize him in your, 
in your review and today that his shtick, his special talent and focus was often on what's going on within the institutions I'm focusing on. What are some of the imminent uh, potentials, developmental potentials there? And when he talks that language, he's not talking about a series of lockstep uh, progressions, which he always disavowed. I mean, what, you're, you're right about the spirit of it. You, you do get a sense that uh, responsive law is something you'd like to have and it's the next on the agenda. But there are all sorts of disclaimers. And in his more detailed fo focus on imminent developments, whether it's in organisations or whether it's in the development of, uh, for example, in, in uh, law society and industrial justice, why is it that he thinks there is the possibility of bringing legal constraint or law-like constraint on industrial operations, on corporations? Well, first of all, a lot of the law, state law which has uh, dealt with this, has failed. Again, most of our lives are lived in organisations. It would be a good thing if uh, arbitrary power were, if we were shielded from arbitrary power. But that's just... You can't dictate to history. He had that with Marx. To say, as he seeks to say in Law Society Industrial Justice, that there is the possibility of generating a frame of rules, not state rules, but rules within the organisations which can constrain the power of the arbitrary power of leaders. Why do you think that's possible? Because you found, or he claims to have found, incipient developments in that direction. Incipient demand, both development, certain things, salutary is coming up, also complaints develop against, because of change in the circumstances of the world, complaints also develop so people are demanding something new. And so if we talk about the uh, development which is essayed in this book, it's big in ideas but it's tiny. When I did my chapter I did a, a talk at Berkeley on uh, on law, society, uh, law and society in transition. And Jonathan Simon said, look, this is all very well, but your chapter is longer than the book. It's a very short book, uh, which has a great deal to say. And where he talks about repressive, uh, autonomous, and responsive law, constantly he's saying, repressive law has certain... Uh, you need some repression. Why? Not you need it. He's not advocating. He said, why... why is it that European, and it's true, it was a Western uh, constrained conception, and then particularly ultimately American constrained, European law was often very repressive in the early ages. Why is that? Well, they didn't have much resources. State building is a hard business, and state builders don't have many resources. They have to farm out. They need help. They need help from other increasingly powerful institutions. This is a sort of version of Weber's idea. But those increasingly powerful bourgeois and other uh, forces demand a bit of the pie. And that might, in proper circumstances, in salutary or, or, or congenial circumstance, generate a demand for some legal autonomy. Why do you think that an autonomy has certain virtues, uh, constraint of power? But now we have all this fuss in the 60s and the 70s, critique of autonomous law, demand for a change to more substantive material law, which a lot of people complain about, Hayek complained about, a lot of other people complain about. They seek, to, in, in this book, to identify why these demands are occurring, what might be expected from responsive law, but they agonise in the book uh, over the dangers which might come from responsive law, and over even the chance that responsive law might be incarnated. So I think there has been... Uh, I might stop being Selznick in a moment, but I think... And anyway, I've got to stop in any event in a moment. But uh, I think that it's a mistake to see this de developmental scheme which he believed in as being one which pretended that history works that way. He believed that... So what did he mean by evolution? He, what he meant was, he did, and I, I say in the book, as you say later, uh, today, that he runs too easily between organ organic and institutional analogies. But what he believed he could identify retrospectively, if you look at developments within 
institution? Why was there a pressure for autonomous law in the 17th and 18th century? Was it because the guys at the top thought this was a good idea? He said, no. It's because a number of... There were a lot of forces which were powerful, which had led support to the centre, which were now making demands, and the various other reasons. Why is responsive law a possibility? Because of developments in administration, developments in complexity of society, etc. Is this going to happen? He doesn't say that. He never says that. In fact, he says the opposite, and he agonised whether it, it, it could or... I don't want to oversell him because in the book that's one of the bases on which I, I criticise him. And I do think that there is some misalliance between his analytic and explanatory intelligence and his prophetic ambitions. And I, that's true of about a lot of large thinkers. It's true of him. The moral Commonwealth is a magnum opus which nobody who liked any of the early books likes, except me. I like them all. But uh, it's an extraordinary work of erudition. And it's got an extraordinarily large scope, which is to try to see the, the sources of moral competence and well-being in modern society. So it deploys, I think, a masterly account of modernity and then asks, well, what does it take to be a morally competent actor, individual, institution, community? These aren't small questions. They were always in the back of everything he did, in a way, but they weren't in the foreground. And that's not a book marred by his prophetic ambitions, uh, though it, it's an attempt to justify a moral conception. But I can understand, and I don't want to seem defensive, I can understand people who are working in real political science and social science being frustrated about a lot of particulars about him. But I just want to end... I just think the enterprise... There are a lot of boring people in him. There are a lot of small games being played. He is an interesting person playing a big game, and that's why you should buy the book. <laughs>